they believe all kinds of things. Um, and I think that today our churches reflect the Corinthian syndrome, as I would call it. So Paul writes to the church, um, and he tells them this, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians within this month in some context of how we should live in today's world, which is typical of what used to happen in Corinth. So 1 Corinthians 1, and the verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from our God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 9 says, God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. Ah. We look at it, Let's look at verse 9 again. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is why in the beginning the Apostle Paul says to us the church I am writing to the church of God in Corinth by the death and resurrection of Jesus we who believe become the church. Thank you very much. The church by nature is in a particular place. But it's part of the church worldwide. What is important in this place is that the church is not a human institution as such, but it is a gathering of believers. And the focus is Christ. To those who have been sanctified in Christ and called to be holy. Because we have been called by God, we have a character of God. We are called and we are sanctified. You know what sanctification is? What is sanctification or consecration? In the Old Testament, you consecrate something for the use of God. There were common things and there were holy things. So for example, if this pulpit is dedicated is consecrated, is separated, and made for the use of God, then it became holy. It took out a nature that it was not only used for any common use, but it was used for God. Consecration, sanctification means, first, the separation from that which is common, and to be made use for God. To be sanctified, we were washed by the blood of Jesus. You and I had our sins forgiven because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We are no longer common persons, but we have become people of God. And therefore, we are separated. 
a Christian is a separated person, sanctified, set apart for God. That, that is meaning that it's not because we go to church, but it is because we belong to God. And we have been made holy. Note that we are not holy in ourselves. But we have been made holy. What is the word holy? What is holiness? Blameless. Blameless. Okay? What is blameless? What is holy? Another word for holy. It's a question. What is holy? If you say, I'm a holy person. You're the Pope? No. Joking. Who's a holy person? Person. Huh? Once you are good, you are a whole person, right? <laughs> okay. So you see, who is holy? A good person. A blameless person. Who is holy? What do you mean by holy? We have been sanctified and made holy. What is it? What is holiness? One who fears the Lord and follows his step. A person who fears God and follows him. Okay? What is holy? I want to hear from... There's no wrong answer. If you hear the word holy, what do you understand by the word holy? Righteous. Faithful. Righteous. Faithful. Huh? Faithful. Faithful. Righteous. To the church in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ and called to be holy. To be holy is to have the character simple of God. And how many of you know that holiness is a process? It is not an end. Yes, it is a relationship that is linked to God. Once I am with God, then I am made holy. It is not what I do. It is first who I am. I am holy. Because I have been sanctified. Because I have been forgiven. And therefore, my outward living would reflect that lifestyle. So I can tell you, I am holy, but my mouth is filthy. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The condition of my heart and the way I live would determine if I am holy or not. The character of God is manifest in me. And what is the character of God? Love, joy, forgiveness. The fruit of the Holy Spirit will be made manifest in us. And that is why in Galatians 5, there is a contrast between a person who is in the spirit, who is holy, and a person who lives according to the flesh. There's a great distinction. It does not mean that one is good than the other. And therefore, holiness is a character that defines what the church is. Because the church is the people of God. So if we look at ourselves today, can we say that we are holy? Hmm? We try to be. Or we live in it. We live in our close relationship with God. And that is why the word righteousness is important in this situation.
I was discussing with a pastor in Germany and this pastor was a missionary to a church in Albania and I know this pastor quite well and I told him how is the work in Albania how are the brethren in Albania and he said to me oh Ahmed you know I'm very sad about what happened in Albania and I said to him what happened he said to me the church in Germany or the or the churches in Germany that contributed money to build a building for the church in Albania they had a conflict they had a disagreement between them the leaders the disagreement with the missionary who was there so what the German church did was that they told them we want our building back from you and actually they went there they took the church to court and they took the building away from them and said this is our building And I go, that's very sad. That's really, really sad. And I said to him, but why did they do so? Why did they do that? Are they not brothers and sisters in the Lord, whether they are in Albania or they are in Germany? If you give something to a Christian brother or to a Christian sister, does it belong to you anymore? So for example, you are a faithful tither in this church. I know this church moved by the tithe and offerings of the people of this church. And then you are going to leave and you say, Pastor, you know what? I remember when you called people to buy the piano, I gave the highest. The piano cost 200 euro, I was the one who gave 150 euro. So, Pastor, I'm taking my piano with, with me to my new church. <laughs> Is that holy behavior? No. Holiness is practical. And that is why Paul here, you know what happened in the Corinthian church? It will come later. When the focus is not Christ. When our focus moves away from Jesus, we can all be in the church. But we will be living separate lives which will not glorify him. And he says to them, but remember who you are. You are sanctified and you are holy. Which means that your behavior must reflect who you are. If you are a banana, be a banana. Don't be an orange. Don't be an apple. If you say that you are a banana, I expect to not only see banana from the outside, I expect that if I bite you, I bite the taste of banana. Can you imagine peeling a banana and tasting an orange? What kind of banana is that? <laughs> but that's what we are sometimes. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I pray every day. But what you see, what you taste, is different. Completely different. And you are sitting in church. You are singing in church. You are giving in church. But your lifestyle is not what you say you are. I look at you, you are a Christian. I talk to you, your language is Christian. On Sunday morning, you have your hands raised, your language is beautiful. But when I come close to you, what I see and what I hear and what I experience is different. How can it be? And therefore, Paul reminds us by the Holy Spirit, you are holy. Jesus has made you holy. He has washed your sins away. You have now been set free. You have now been made a person to live for the glory of God, which is holiness. Therefore, live a holy life. But 
what are the things which sometimes takes us away from living away? And that's why he comes to the point of grace. Huh? This, look at verse 3. May the grace and the peace of God be with you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is saying, believe me, there are many times that you will not be able to fit in that characteristic that God expects of you. And therefore, it is by his grace and his peace. There are times that I wake up, I look at myself in the mirror and I go, you don't, you don't feel like a Christian. You did not act in a Christian way. Do you experience that yourself as well, or is it only me? But there are times that I look at myself and I go, ha ha, you are a pastor, look at you. If there was someone here who saw what you are doing or what you are saying, they would be proud of you. And I feel ashamed. And at that point, I go for grace. I go and I say, God, forgive me. Your grace is sufficient. That is the point of sanctification and righteousness. Because you cannot be holy unless there is repentance. Unless there is an acceptance of your own failures as a person. And that is why the grace of God is new every morning. That is why you and I can rejoice and say today is a new day. Yesterday, I didn't succeed in being who God wanted me to be. But another chance has been given to me to live with him. And therefore, I can go on my knees and I can go for the grace of God. And you know, where there is grace, there is peace. Where there is no grace, there is no peace. And the peace here is reconciliation. When we live in sin, we are enemies of God. But when we receive grace and repent, then there is reconciliation and peace between us and God. So he says to you, grace and peace to you from God. Therefore, don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Ah, I failed already. What a hypocrite I am. Yes, you are. But there is a way to stop, repent, and continue in the walk of righteousness. So that we don't live by guilt, but we live by grace. Amen? You need grace. I need grace every day. If there's someone who tells you that you can be perfect, He's a liar. Look at them in the eyes and say, no, it's not true. Holiness does not mean perfection. The only person who is perfect is God. And that is why holiness is a process. And that process is perfected as long as we remain in Him. The more we walk away from God, the difficult it becomes to reflect His glory and His holiness. The closer we are to Him, the more that our character is formed day by day to reflect Him. So holiness is a process. If you are in this room today and you say, listen, I am not a perfect person, welcome. I am not a perfect person. But it does not mean that I go and I do something and I say I'm sorry and I do it again and I say I'm sorry and I do it again. That is not grace. That is a rejection of grace. We live in freedom. But if we take our freedom for granted, we become 
slaves of sin. So, the fact that I am not holy, you know, I am not perfect, but I am holy. And, that's the, and that is it. That it is God who makes me holy. It is the Holy Spirit who works in my heart to make me holy. And that is why verse 4 is critical. I always thank God for you because of His grace. This means that we don't judge each other. You know that the more that we fellowship with each other, the more we become closer, the more you see how faulty the person is. You live with me in my house for a week. I wouldn't even tell you a week, two days. And you begin to know who Ahmed is. And I can, I can do the same thing with me and you. Or work with you for the same week. Now, I'm not telling you that I am a monster. But I'm telling you that the more that we fellowship one another, the more that we come closer to God, the more that we will say, Sorry, Joyce, I'm going to use your name. Since you are what's the name. You know, Joyce, she was leading the worship this morning, but did you hear? Do you know that Joyce is. <laughs> did you see that Leon was praying this morning? It's a show because Leon is. <laughs> Do you know, Pastor Ahmed, you know, da 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 da. I thank God for you always. Do you know that the Corinthians were the most, they were the ones who gave the Apostle Paul the most problem. If you read in 1 Corinthians, they actually rejected him as an apostle. And yet he says to them, I thank God for you and for who you are. I choose to see you as a child of God. I don't choose to see you as a person in the flesh anymore. I thank God for you because of his grace. I can accept you because of God's grace. I can love you because of God's grace. Not because you're perfect, but because we all come from God's grace and we need that encouragement one to another for in him you have been enriched in all ways he says and God has blessed you and look at verse 8 he will keep you strong to the end and then he says God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The cross is God's act of commitment to us who we'll walk with him. Faithfulness is not that God will do everything for you. Faithfulness is a character of God. He does not say God can be faithful. He says God is faithful. It is a character of God. What sometimes leads us astray is when we start to doubt in God. And I always try to tell this practical story. And I have seen it happen many times as a pastor, especially in the area of relationships. You know, the human need to love and be loved is one of the most powerful emotions one can have, both men and women. 
But you are called to live in a generation, in a society that is living by different standards. I was telling you, nowadays, people do not care about what relationships are. Relationships are characterized by promiscuity. For example, some people will say to you, if I don't know who you are, meaning if I don't go to bed with you, how can I marry you? Or relationships are based on external things. So can you imagine that you are a Christian? And this was the problem of the Corinthians in some way. You have been praying for a partner. I have said this a million times. And I say it on a purpose. And no one comes. In the church, you look, there are no Christians, young people. We share the same vision as you do. We don't have the same outlook of life as you do. And you go out and in your professional world you find, or in your workplace, you find someone. Or, as it happens many times, I was with the, uh, the director for migration and refugees in Germany, Dr. Schmidt, and we were talking and he told me, Ahmed, let me ask you one thing. So yes, he said. He said, don't take it personal. I said, try me. He said to me, why did you marry a wife? And I go, we met in the prayer meeting. He told me, with, he said, most of the Africans I have met, in Germany at least, who are married to Germans, they are married of convenience because they want the paper to live in Germany. I said, yeah, it's possible. said to him, I have met a few, but I can't make any judgments on that. I said to him, he said, maybe when I met my wife, the, the strength of having to live in Malta, okay, was probably stronger as well. I said, but I don't know. He said to me, would you have married your wife if you would not have had a paper to live in, in Malta? And I had to think about it very deeply. And I said, yes. Of course I would say, yes. <laughs> but it's something you need to think deeper. And then I asked myself as a Christian. I'm a Filipino. I don't know about, about Filipinos or Africans. And then I meet an African man. You know? And then I meet a Filipino who's a professional, but not a Christian.